Hey everyone, this lesson is on shingles or herpes zoster. In this lesson we're going to talk about what shingles is, why it happens, some of the risk factors, and we're also going to talk about how we can diagnose and treat it. So as we all know, it's a very painful, self-limited vesicular rash with acute neuritis. I'm going to talk about what all those terms mean more specifically in the next couple of slides. So shingles or herpes zoster is due to reactivation of the varicella zoster virus from dorsal root ganglion nerves. The virus lies dormant in dorsal root ganglion after an initial infection with varicella zoster virus which causes chickenpox. So in order for an individual to actually get shingles they would have had to have had an infection with chickenpox virus sometime in their life prior. So that's very important. So what happens is the virus most oftentimes will occur in childhood. So a child will get chickenpox, the virus will lie dormant in dorsal root ganglion nerve suppressed by the immune system, lies dormant for several decades oftentimes, and it will reactivate due to several causes, and one of these is due to immunosuppression. So as I mentioned before, the immune system suppresses the virus, but if in cases of illness or some other cause of immunosuppression, the virus can reactivate within the dorsal root ganglion nerves to cause shingles. So what are some of the risk factors for shingles? Some of the risk factors for shingles include increasing age. This is actually the most important risk factor and in particular we see an increase in prevalence of shingles after the age of 50. The second risk factor is an immunocompromised state or condition. This makes sense. If your immune system is suppressing the varicella zoster virus, any immune compromised condition can lead to reactivation of the virus in dorsal root ganglion nerves. The third risk factor is transplant patients. Transplant patients are on immunocompromising medications to help suppress their immune system from attacking the transplanted organ. So these individuals will be immunocompromised, leading to reactivation of the shingles virus. Autoimmune conditions, so any issues with the immune system in general can cause issues in suppressing the virus. Female gender, female gender because they have more issues with autoimmune conditions. Individuals of European descent are more likely to have issues with shingles. Chronic disease states like lung or kidney disease. Again, this is all due to large systemic conditions that lead to an immunocompromised state and even physical trauma. So physical trauma to a certain area in the body can actually cause damage to the nerves in that area, the dermatome and this can actually lead to a reactivation. So shingles has three phases of illness. The first one is what we call pre-eruptive phase. Pre-eruptive phase is also what we call pre-herpetic neuralgia. Pre-herpetic neuralgia because there is neuralgia, there is nerve pain prior to the eruption of herpetiform vesicles. The pain is generally severe and we can see what we call paresthesias as well, numbness, tingling sensations in the area, usually in one or more dermatomes. And the pre-eruptive phase is associated with other systemic symptoms like headache, malaise, myalgia, fatigue, and uncommonly fever. This phase generally lasts one to 10 days. So an individual might be complaining of pain in a certain area in their body, but there's no rash. They don't see anything yet. They just feel pain. They have some numbness, tingling sensations, and maybe some itching in that area, but that's very uncommon as well. The next phase of shingles is what we call the acute eruptive phase. The acute eruptive phase is actually when we start to see the herpetiform vesicles. So we get severe pain with herpetiform vesicles on an erythematous base. So there's an underlying skin that's very red with vesicles that erupt. And again, these occur on one or more dermatomes. And what's important about shingles is that it doesn't cross the midline. So because it is localized to a dermatome, it doesn't cross the midline. So we're not going to see herpetiform vesicles cross the midline. We're going to see it creep up and it'll kind of abruptly stop at the midline of someone's body. So I'll show you an image to further explain this a bit later. We can also see regional lymphadenopathy. So just because of the inflammation in that area, we might see some increased lymph nodes, some regional lymphadenopathy. The vesicles themselves will erupt. They will be described as clear at the beginning. That eventually become cloudy. After becoming cloudy, the vesicles then rupture and then crust over and involute. So you get these crusty lesions afterwards. And then the thoracic and lumbar dermatomes are the most commonly affected. So thoracic up near the thorax, lumbar, so anywhere near the, the uh, abdomen or lower waist area, all can be affected. And this phase generally lasts two to three days. So here's an image of an acute eruptive phase of shingles. So as you can see, there are fluid-filled vesicles that are generally in clusters. 
So they're clustered in groups. And they are all on top of an erythematous base. And the erythematous base can be described as patchy. So it's not completely filled. This dermatome, the, this dermatome is not completely filled with an erythematous base, but it's kind of patchy. So we see fluid-filled vesicles in clusters on an erythematous patchy base. And here is the midline of the individual. As you can see, that acute eruption of shingles doesn't cross the midline. It remains in this dermatome or one or more contiguous dermatomes, but it doesn't cross the midline. So those are very key indicators that this is shingles. Now, the last phase of shingles is what we call the chronic phase. So after that two to three days of acute eruptive phase where the vesicles erupt, crust over, and involute, we can get what we call post-herpetic neuralgia. So we can still have nerve pain even without that eruption. This can be a persistent or recurring pain so that one area where it had erupted originally will continue to have pain or an intermittent recurring pain. There's higher rates of this post-herpetic neuralgia in the elderly population. And with the chronic phase, we can also see scarring from those erupted vesicles. This phase can last for a long time. It can last for 30 days or more, and it can even last for months to years. So there are two other manifestations of shingles I want to discuss. The first one is this one, and it's called herpes zoster ophthalmicus. It's essentially shingles that affects the eye. And this one's very important to detect and to treat because if we don't treat it, we can get issues with sight and can get blindness in that eye. And what we can see is generally, if we look at the eye and we can look at this picture here, similar presentation to what we saw before, erythematous base, and it's in several contiguous dermatomes, but it doesn't cross the midline. It kind of stops abruptly. And in the eye, we can see conjunctivitis. So the eye can look very uh, reddened and injected. There can be scleritis, episcleritis, keratitis, argyle, Robertson pupil. So if you were to do a swinging flashlight test, you can detect that. And uh, glaucoma and retinitis as well. So all these things can be very detrimental to an individual and their sight. So you want to detect herpes zoster ophthalmicus. The other one is herpes zoster oticus. So it's a shingles infection involving the ear. It can be the outer ear or even the inner or middle ear. So this is a very important one as well because we don't want to lose hearing in the affected ear. And if there is facial paralysis associated with the herpes zoster oticus, it is known as Ramsey-Hunt syndrome. Just something to remember. So how do we diagnose and how do we treat shingles? The diagnosis of shingles involves PCR for detection of the viral DNA. If we were to take a swab of the vesicular fluid or blood, we can run that through PCR and actually see the herpes zoster virus and we can do direct fluorescent antibody, or we can do a jank smear. Treatment of shingles all depends on the timing of the acute eruptive phase. If it's within 72 hours, we can initiate antiviral therapy, valacyclovir or acyclovir. If it's greater than 72 hours, we can treat it if they're still having new lesions. But otherwise, if they're not having new lesions, the lesions are involuting, and it's been greater than 72 hours, it's of little benefit at that time, because it's again, it's a self-limiting infection. But if if it's before 72 hour time period, we can treat it with an antiviral. And in the case of complications of shingles like post-herpetic neuralgia, we can use analgesics, gabapentin, and pregabalin. So those are good medications to treat that neuropathic pain. We could also use tricyclic antidepressants like amitriptyline. So again, diagnosis typically by PCR, direct fluorescent antibody, or dank smear. And treatment is determined by the timing of the acute eruption. So less than 72 hours, initiate antiviral. Greater than 72 hours, little benefit of the antiviral medication. And then for post-herpetic neurology, analgesics, gabapentin, and pregabal. So now that we've talked about treatment of shingles, we can talk about prevention of shingles in the first place. So prevention involves vaccinations. So we can prevent varicella zoster viral infection from occurring in the first place. So again, as I mentioned before, we need to have a prior infection with chickenpox in order to get shingles. So if we actually prevent getting an infection with chickenpox, we can prevent shingles in the future. So the vaccine, measles, mumps, rubella, varicella, or MMRV vaccine can help reduce the likelihood of getting a chickenpox infection early in life. So MMRV vaccinations have reduced the chances of getting chickenpox infections. And if an individual was previously infected with varicella zoster virus, they had chickenpox when they were younger, we can use a zoster vaccine. So a vaccine specifically to prevent 
herpes, zoster, or shingles. This is known as shingrix. So shingrix has been shown to reduce the likelihood of developing shingles. So again, we can try to prevent the varicella zoster viral infection from occurring in the first place by using the MMRV vaccine early in childhood. Or if an individual has already been infected with chickenpox, we can use the zoster vaccine, Shingrix. So those are the two options we have for preventing shingles. So if you want to learn more about other skin infections, please check out my dermatology playlist. And if you haven't already, please consider liking, subscribing, and clicking the notification bell to help support the channel. And as always, thanks so much for watching, and I hope to see you next time.